The idea that there's one God, but that one God or divinity has many different names. And just as the sun rises in the morning in one part of the world and is known by a certain name, and then later on it sets and in another part of the world it rises and is known by a different name, but that same sun is what's functioning. a question do you sometimes think the balance here changes and if you say yes I want to ask you what changes it can anyone did anyone discuss that or would anyone like to offer a reflection on that okay we got someone here I sometimes do interactives as well because you guys can give me good material for my next talk. <laughs> I am at Stanford after all, I can like, you know, get something from it. Yeah, so our groups discuss that, um, you know, often sometimes there are situations in which destiny might sort of set the stage uh, for, for your free will to then you know, evolve and, and take the reins. And in that sense, I think, uh, you know, I personally believe that there are powers that be and they have set up this world for us to inhabit. And what we do within that, um, you know, is largely down to free will. So maybe, you know, at, upon creation or uh, when we get down to our nature, there's a lot of destiny involved. What we do with that then I think shifts towards free will. It's an amazing perspective, yeah, that destiny or fate or whatever we call it sets a stage. And after all, all the world's a stage and everyone's simply a player. But then when you get onto the stage, you have the free will within that arena. Yes, we're surrounded by a certain amount of people. Yes, we're surrounded by a certain amount of wealth. Yes, we've been given a certain amount of cognitive abilities. But now what are we going to do with that? And according to what we do with that, would you say it then creates our next stage? Yeah, I think it does. And, um, you know, I don't know, I could be wrong. I personally want to believe that it does because otherwise I feel I will become complicit and complacent in yeah. systems of oppression or systems of, you know, maintaining the status quo. And so... If I don't at least believe that, that my free will, yeah, yeah, that that will impact the future, uh, then I would never do anything at all. And I think that would be a tragedy. That would be a tragedy, yes, <laughs> definitely. No, thank you so much. That's brilliant. Okay, I'll take one more at the back there, and then I'll kind of move on. I think there's someone here with some, some points here. Yeah. Uh, I think there is, uh, it, but whether this full free will or full destiny, um, anything can be at, attributed fully to free will or fully to destiny, I think really depends on uh, what your sphere of influence is. So if, if you're just talking about yourself, so, uh, okay, should I, should I take that job or not? You know, should I marry this person or not? So maybe it affects your life. But, uh, so, so in that context, maybe you have free will. But if you look at how, I don't know, events. zooming back, like how the planet is going to evolve yeah, or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, there is, maybe your actions don't really matter. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And there is a connection between those And do you two? believe it's, it's possible to increase your sphere of influence? Probably. Do you believe that by your free will, you can become a global change maker? Or that's beyond your control? What do you believe? Uh, maybe. It's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, that's why we're here. Yeah, it's a good question. So here I am. I'm just kind of yeah. You can see I'm just uh, we're just opening up this topic just to get us thinking. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you some ideas. I want you to think about these ideas, and then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up, and then we'll just have a discussion. I think that's a progressive way to go. Uh, I'll kind of set the tone, uh, set some parameters, some ideas, and then let's see what all of you think about it. What I'm going to try to present to you is when I was 15, I started reading the Bhagavad Gita, and it kind of became a fascinating book for me 
and something which over 25 years later I, I still continue to study. And what I'm going to try and share with you is some of the insights given in the Bhagavad Gita. And essentially, I'm going to share with you four statements. The first statement is that free will is the basis of life. The second statement is that free will is not final. Uh, the third one is that free will needs to be freed. And the fourth one will be free will is actually the determinant of your success. So I'm going to just share these ideas with you and see, see if it resonates. And if it doesn't, then I'm happy for you to challenge. Of course, I'll win. I'm <laughs> joking. Okay, so the first thing that the Bhagavad Gita really shares with us is that free will is the basis of life. As was said here, if we take free will out of the equation, if we believe that we're just pre-programmed robots in a universal machine that's heading according to a plot which is beyond our imagination, then life would become somewhat meaningless. So what the Bhagavad Gita does is it actually gives us somewhat of a blueprint of reality. I found this uh, blueprint of reality to be incredibly powerful. And what I found when I studied the Bhagavad Gita is that this blueprint, by referring to it, actually helped me to decode any existential question I had. In other words, these principles were able to unpack mysteries of life, the universe, and everything. And essentially, the spiritual blueprint of the Bhagavad Gita encompasses five topics. The first topic of the Bhagavad Gita is known as Atma, or the soul. Where the Bhagavad Gita really begins as a spiritual book is by discussing identity. Who are we? Who are we in our essence? Our body is changing. Our mind, our intelligence, even our personality changes. Our designations change. Our positions in the world changes. So who are we beyond all of the changes of this world in essence? Uh, what is that um, self that's driving everything? And what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that we are actually a spiritual being, a spark of consciousness that the body, the mind, and even our subtle capacities are simply instruments that we're utilizing. And therefore, uh, as spiritual beings, sparks of consciousness, we exist before this life. We continue to exist after this life. And that concept that this life is just a chapter, that we are spiritual beings on a human journey, uh, that concept in itself already gives us a whole picture or part of the puzzle to free will and destiny. But that's where the Bhagavad Gita begins. The next topic of the Bhagavad Gita is nature. In Sanskrit, this is known as Prakriti. And nature literally means what is, the, what is this reality that we're living in right now? How did it come about? What is it composed of? What are the influences around us and how do they affect us as spiritual beings? And so the second thing the Bhagavad Gita does is help us to understand the landscape within which we're functioning at the moment, almost this stage that we're on at the moment. And then the Bhagavad Gita talks about karma. Yes. Karma is very, very interesting. Karma is an interesting word because it can be used in many different contexts. Sometimes karma can just mean an activity. Sometimes karma can mean the reaction to an activity. And sometimes karma can refer to a law that governs the reaction that you get for every action. So karma is a complex word encompassing many different things. But essentially, what Krishna talks about in the Bhagavad Gita is that as a soul living in this world, we are constantly active and we're always doing something. And because we're always doing something, performing karma, we're also continuously receiving karma. And the universe, almost through the law of karma, uh, you could say gives us like cosmic sensitivity training. 
like the world, the universe reacts to many of our actions in such a way as to elevate our consciousness. And that's basically what karma is. If you do a good action, you get a good reaction. If you do a bad action, you get a bad reaction. And of course, it's much more complex than that. But that's the basic principle, that nothing that happens in our life is random. Nothing that happens is just by chance. That every single occurrence in this world is meaningful and is uh, pregnant with a lesson and an opportunity to evolve and uplift ourselves. They said there's a new restaurant in town. It's called Karma. But there's no menu. You get what you deserve. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that one in. The next topic of the Bhagavad Gita is Kal or time. Time is fascinating. Because time is the destructive factor which changes everything. In the ancient Eastern concept of time, time is not linear. There's not a beginning and end, but it constantly goes in cycles. So just as we have the cycles of the seasons, right? Like winter, spring, summer, autumn, and then it goes round again. Uh, similarly, the cosmos runs through a universal cycle. Similarly, we are running through a cycle even in science, they say energy cannot be created or destroyed, but simply transferred. So this concept of time is incredibly, uh, incredibly insightful. And basically what Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita is that things are running in a cosmos. Uh, and the final topic of the Bhagavad Gita is Ishvara or God, divinity. The idea that outside of this whole material system, there is another reality, another identity, another um, realm of living. And that this line is very, very interesting. The Bhagavad Gita is a book of what we call yoga. Nowadays, people think of yoga as a physical exercise, but yoga comes from the Sanskrit yuj, which literally means to connect, to link, to combine. And therefore, as spiritual beings, we're currently within a material sphere, but actually this is, a, um, this is a foreign environment. Actually, we're spiritual beings and we have a connection in another realm. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis says very beautifully, if I find in myself a desire which no experience of this world can fulfill, then I must conclude I was made for another world. So very, very beautiful, the idea that there is another realm and that the soul resides in that realm. This afternoon we were at UC Berkeley and I was just sharing with the students that every fairy tale ends and they lived happily ever after. And it's very interesting because in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says the soul has three qualities. Sat, it's eternal. Jit, it's sentient. And Ananda, it's full of bliss. And it's very interesting because when we say they lived happily ever after, ever after refers to Sat, the eternality of the soul. Lived refers to Chit, the sentience of the soul. And happily refers to Ananda, the bliss aspect of the soul. And so it's incredible, even when writers say they lived happily ever after, they're making an incredibly profound theological point, which points to the very essence of the soul, according to ancient Vedic literatures. This is incredibly powerful, because if you have any existential question, all those questions I was asking, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do people who seem to have all the material things still seem unhappy? Uh, why does death occur? What happens after death? Uh, is there a God? Why can't I see God? If you refer to this framework, you can practically decode any of those questions. And in that way, this kind of blueprint really deserves a closer look. In reference to Today's discussion, the first point I wanted to make is that free will is the basis of life. 
So what the Bhagavad Gita explains is that the soul in the world is always endowed with free will because the soul has a relationship of love with the divine. And how can there be love if there's no free will? And so the divine always endows the soul with free will to explore its own desires. The divine does not enforce or impose itself upon the soul, but rather allows the soul to explore and uh, investigate what may be interesting to itself. And therefore, you see very interesting, even at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna has given all the knowledge to Arjun, then he concludes the book with an amazing statement. He says to Arjun, now I've given you all the knowledge, think about it, challenge it, reflect on it, and then do what you want to do. And that is an incredible exhibit. I mean, God is not a religious fanatic. He's ready to allow the soul to exercise its own free will. So it's said that God gives every soul, according to the Bhagavad Gita, one thing that divinity never takes away from us is our free will. Yet, according to the Bhagavad Gita, there is more to the story. The second thing I want to share with you is that free will needs to be free. <laughs> Every soul is given the capacity to exercise their free will. But have you noticed that some people seem to act in a way in which they seem to be being impelled and not really exercising their free will? Have you ever experienced that? What about this? Do you think someone that picks up a cigarette packet and smokes the cigarette is exercising their free will? Put your hand up if you would say yes. Put your hand up if you would say no. And put your hand up if you don't know. <laughs> It's an interesting concept. It's interesting on cigarette packets over the decades, the, the messages have changed. In the 80s, it was like, smoking may injure your health. In the 90s, it was smoking seriously damages your health. In the 2000s, it was uh, smoking kills. And later on, they even start showing uh, what happens inside people's body when you smoke. Yet, um, sales are increasing. So that's interesting. I won't answer the question at this point. What about this one? <laughs> Utilizing your free will or impelled, pushed? Is it your discrimination? Are you making a sentient, conscious choice every time you pick up your phone? Is interesting. And this is my favorite one. What about this one? Yes, yes, yes. Road rage. We will responding uh, in a measured, uh, considered way, or uh, impulsive. Interesting. We have free will, but there's a sense in which it seems as though sometimes we're so influenced that our own capacity to exercise our discrimination is also being limited. So the first message of the Bhagavad Gita was that free will is the basis of life. But the second message of the Bhagavad Gita is that if you actually want to utilize your free will, then you have to become free of the influences in this world. The Bhagavad Gita gives an incredible... Uh, remember I was saying the second topic of the Bhagavad Gita is Prakriti or the nature. And in that topic, what Krishna explains is something called the Gunas. You, you may be familiar with this. Krishna basically explains in the Bhagavad Gita that there are three kind of basic energies in this world. Uh, tamas or ignorance, which is almost like a dulling, a kind of covering energy. 
and then rajas, which is passion, which is almost like a very creative, agitating energy, and then sattva, which basically means goodness, which is a very clarifying and uplifting energy. And what Krishna says is that as we rise to live in higher modes of nature, as we live in our life to create a lifestyle which is more and more in sattva, then what happens is we become more and more capable of exercising our free will. But the more and more you descend and become covered by lower energies, then what happens is your ability to exercise your free will then gets severely impeded. And then what Krishna goes on to do in the Bhagavad Gita is tell the characteristics of how to develop sattva. So believe it or not, Krishna talks about how to have a diet in the mode of sattva, how to structure your lifestyle so that you're engendering sattva. And later on, by this framework, you can learn how to do practically anything in your life in sattva. You can learn how to parent your children in sattva. You can learn how to study for your exams in sattva. You can learn how to drive your car <laughs> in sattva. And the more you live in sattva, the more you become clarified and then you're not so controlled. It's amazing people walk through this world thinking they're free, but actually they've become covered by the lower modes of nature which mean that they're being impelled to act in ways that don't uh, fulfill what they're actually looking for. When we joined the monastery, one of the monks said, I'm going to give you a line and I want you to write it down and put it on your locker. So I said, tell me, I'm fascinated. And he said, don't give up what you want most for what feels good now. And he said, if you can do this, watch your life transform. But that's so hard for people to do because it seems that our ability to always be in contact with our higher will is impeded. So the second statement of the Bhagavad Gita, yes, we have free will. That's the basis of life. But free will needs to be freed up. And that means to live in a certain way to engender higher energies. The third message I want to give you from the Bhagavad Gita when it comes to free will is that free will is not final. So I began today by looking at this continuum, destiny and free will. And basically, this is what Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says there are three doers, three architects which are involved in designing your destiny. The first architect is us, the soul. We can desire, we can endeavor, we can put our best efforts into doing something. Say, for example, one of you want to achieve a certain position in your career, then you can desire that, you can have the intention, you can put the attention and you can perform the action to try and manifest that to your best of your ability. But after that, it's out of your control. And then what Krishna basically talks about is that there's a super consciousness or what we call a super soul or some higher divinity, a higher intelligence which is then sanctioning, sanctioning what happens in one's future. And what does the super soul look at when, when deciding what to sanction, what one's desire is, and also what their karmic stock is? So according to the Bhagavad Gita, we've performed activities in many, many lives, and therefore we have a certain amount of karmic stock. And so if I want to achieve something in this life, what divinity looks at is my desire and also my karmic stock. 
And based on those two things, material nature is the third architect of our destiny. Because then nature then conspires and acts in such a way to basically manifest what is sanctioned by the superconsciousness. So say, I mean, just to give a very simple example. Say there are two, two people and their desire is they want to live in a really big house. Um, so then what will happen is that that's their desire. So then the super soul will look at their desire to live in a really big house, but then look at their karma. And if someone has the good karma, the necessary credit, then what will happen is that situation will manifest as that person desired to live in a big house and have that mansion. But if the person doesn't have the karma, then it may manifest in a different way. Someone may become, I don't know, a butler in a mansion or something. And in that way, their desire is still fulfilled, but in a way that's congruent with their uh, karmic credit. I'm just giving a very simplistic example, but just so you get the idea. So this helps us to understand what is that other factor that's determining my future outside of my own control. And according to the Bhagavad Gita, that other factor is karma. Because we don't have, uh, as nice as it sounds, the power of manifestation and the power to attract anything you want in life basically goes contrary to our experience. Because uh, it seems that there are fortunes at every corner of our life which seem to be affecting us in ways that, um, that we can't control. And so Krishna says free will is not final. Free will is one component in the making of your future. But there is a higher um, system by which that free will is then processed and your destiny decided. And then I'll give you the final statement. Free will is what defines success. This is very beautiful. In the last slide, it can sometimes feel a little bit disempowering that I'm not in control of my life, that I can't realize all my dreams, that I can't be successful, that even if I try my best but it's not meant to be, I won't get it and I won't find happiness. But what Krishna very talk, beautifully talks about in the Bhagavad Gita is that your exercise of your free will, your endeavor, your effort, your ability and choice to try the best you can in any activity, that is the success. In life, we define success by results. In life, we define success by power, by position, by people followers, by profit, by percentage, by position in a ranking. But what Krishna says is that real success is in trying your best and endeavoring, in exercising your free will to the best of your ability. Because the idea is that once you've exercised your free will to the best of your ability, divinity will then reciprocate with that usage of free will and architect and design the best situation for you. And therefore, for a spiritualist, success is not in results. Success is in the complete utilization of their free will to do something uh, with the best of intention. And then whatever happens after that, the spiritualist accepts as the best course for their life. And therefore, uh, in this way, even though, according to the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, there is an element of destiny and fate which is, uh, which is acting in our life. 
It in no way has to reduce our sense of happiness or feeling of success because we simply have to try our best and then whatever comes is ultimately for the best. And so what we share with people is that oftentimes, you've all seen this before, we put so much emphasis on things that are beyond our control. Whereas rather what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is that you have free will. So work within your circle of influence. Work with, your, with those things you have control over. And what will happen is that then the things in the circle of concern and how those things change, leave that to divinity, leave that to higher laws. Because however that conspires after you've tried your best is always for the best. And so in this way, Krishna explains that uh, free will is actually the basis of success, not the picture perfect uh, idea that we have of the future. And in that way, we can find perfection in the moment instead of waiting for something to happen in our life. And so that's what I wanted to share with you. So just to summarize, what is the Bhagavad Gita's perspective on free will? Number one, free will is the basis of life. Without free will, there's no meaning to life and therefore everyone has free will. But number two, free will has to be freed. If we live in a certain way, free of the influences of this world, then we open up more capacity to make conscious decisions that can lead us towards the life we're looking for. Number three, free will is not final. Even after you've exercised your free will, there's karma, there's divinity, and there are higher powers which are deciding your future. But number four, free will determines success. Even though your future is somewhat out of your hands, it's not completely in your hands, let me say that. That doesn't mean it, it has any bearing on you uh, not being able to have a happy life because your exercise of free will and your endeavor and your effort and your noble um, attempt to try for something is perfection in and of itself and whatever ensues from that is perfect according to divinity's uh, plan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for your patience and your attention and uh, and being here tonight. Um, do we have some time for questions? Yeah, we have some time. If you if you have any questions or perhaps you have some comments or some reflections, um, anything you wanted a clarification on, then uh, I'm happy to field some of those questions. Here. I was wondering what how you define divinity. How do I define divinity? Oh wow, that's a big question. <laughs> so according to the Bhagavad Gita, let me, let me begin high level and then I'll go into more detail. According to Bhagavad Gita, uh, there's one God. Um, so how do we account for the variety of theology, philosophy, understandings of divinity that we see in the world today? And what the Bhagavad Gita basically explains is that God reveals himself or divinity reveals itself to different people at different times, in different ways, in a way that is relatable, understandable and uh, relevant to the people of that time. And therefore we find that different theologies appear in the history of the world. And according to the Vedic understanding, there's a unity and diversity. The idea that there's one God, but that one God or divinity has many different names. And just as the sun rises in the morning in one part of the world and it's known by a certain name, and then later on it sets and in another part of the world it rises and it's known by a different name, but that same sun is what's functioning. So that's the first kind of high level understanding that Divinity is the, the, the one supreme personality that all theologies are in pursuance of and trying to connect to, but just in different ways, through different uh, rituals and through a different theological and um, 
cultural path. But then the Bhagavad Gita goes into more detail to describe the nature of that divinity. Is that divinity a person? Is that divinity an energy? Is that divinity like an inner residing uh, kind of uh, companion? And what the Bhagavad Gita says is it's all three. Three people went to a train station and they wanted to understand what's a train. So one of them saw the light and the sound of the train and they said, I know what a train is, it's light and sound, left. The other two stayed longer, the train came in. The second person said, I know what a train is, it's light, sound, and it's, uh, it has compartments, left. Third one waited a little longer, people came out. He said, I know what a train is, it has light, sound, it's compartments, and it's people going from one place to another. They all had a grasp of what a train was, but to different levels of detail. So in the same way, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, in some traditions, divinity is known as an energy, an all-pervading kind of universal consciousness. And that's true. But beyond that, it's said that God is an indwelling companion, what we call the super soul. Um, and beyond that, the Bhagavad Gita says divinity is a person, a person who has a personality, a person who you can speak to, laugh with, converse with, and have a relationship with. It makes sense because in the heart of hearts, what we all look for is love. Sometimes we ask people, what's the universal pursuit in life? And they say happiness. And while that's true, if we think about where happiness really comes from, it's relationships and love. They say in today's day and age, uh, what we really should do is use things and love people. But what we often do today is we love things and we use people. But actually, when we look at our lives, what we seek is relationship, love, exchange. But in the world today, we see is so much of frustrated love. And if you don't believe me, just look at the songs people are singing. <laughs> Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. And the very next day. So the universal quest is to find love, to find connection, to find relationship. And therefore it makes sense that in our connection with divinity, how can it not embody that kind of love, that exchange, that intimacy? And so this is the nature of divinity that's described in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and, and I guess we could go in more detail, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you for that beautiful question. Can I see hands? Uh, um, hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was very um, interesting and engaging. So I'm not as familiar with the concept of karma. I've heard the term and you did speak on it a bit. A bit. The question I have is that what determines one's karma? Because I get the sense from the talk that the extent of one's free will is predetermined by whatever karmic uh, constraints have been set up for them. So, um, you know, do individuals have some kind of influence over the karma they have in life? Or is it just, you know, can you please talk more about it? I'm just more yes, curious. Yes, thank you so much, yeah. So remember I mentioned that the purpose of karma is to educate us. Why, do you, why does divinity arrange for us to receive a certain reaction when we perform a certain action, because that reaction is meant to be educational. So the idea of karma is education. We receive certain reactions in this life because it's meant to bring us into a higher state of awareness. So can we change our karma? Can we break free from that karma? Yes, by learning the lessons. Say, for example, someone is imprisoned or sentenced to jail for 20 years. Then often what they'll do is after 10 years, they'll call that person and interview them. And if sometimes they feel the person has reformed, 
learned their lessons, then what they may say is, go free. In other words, there's no need to spend the other 10 years in prison because the purpose of that imprisonment has been served. So how do we get rid of our karma or how do we experience a more free life by learning the lessons that karma is trying to teach us? But what often happens in our life is when karmic things happen to us, we get frustrated, we feel ourselves to be the victim, and we don't have the presence to ask ourselves, what am I supposed to be learning from this? There was a cartoon once and someone was looking up at God and said, God, change my situation. And God was looking down saying, but I sent that situation so you change yourself. <laughs> So everything is purposeful, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard. Another Christian uh, minister, he reflects very nicely. He said, God, I prayed to you for love, and you just kept sending me people who needed help. I prayed to you for strength, and you just kept sending me problems to solve. I prayed to you for wisdom, and you just sent me... Uh, all these uh, twists and turns and ups and downs in my life. And then he said, God, now I realize you gave me everything I needed, but nothing that I wanted. <laughs> and that's basically karma. So it's very amazing. Um, yesterday we were at Intel and we spoke about looking back to look forward. And we were talking about how in the world, people learn from books, people learn from teachers, people learn in lecture theaters, but you know the most powerful, persistent, and uh, life-changing teacher is experience. But it must be experience that is digested and processed in the right way because every experience is a karmic consequence which is a lesson meant to evolve our consciousness. And so, basically, yes, we can break through of karma. But it means we need to learn the lessons that that karma is trying to teach us. These are deep topics. <laughs> I'm just giving some kind of... Uh, but I hope that helps in some way. Yes. Thank you for the great talk. I really appreciate it. It's really eye-opening. Um, about the free will, what do you feel about how can free will help us find our goals when you run out of it, for example? When you cannot think what's the next step sometimes, how can free will help you think about those goals and eventually achieve those? So how can, how can we utilize our free will when we seem to run out of energy and we don't know the next step? One philosopher, he says, intelligence means to know what to do when you don't know what to do. <laughs> In the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> Arjun has an existential crisis. He comes to the point where he understands, I don't know the answers. I don't know the way forward. I don't know what next step I'm meant to take in my life. In one verse, he talks about something called Dharma Shamuda. Dharma means your purpose, your essence, your calling. And Shamuda means a confusion. So he says, I'm confused, I'm bewildered, I'm baffled. I have no idea what I'm meant to do next. We sometimes experience this in our life. Recently, I turned 42. Someone came to me and said, how old are you today? I said, 42. He said, you're in the zone. I said, what do you mean? He said, midlife crisis. I said, come on, man, like, don't curse me here. So like sometimes we have those moments of crisis. We don't know what's the next step. But what does Arjun do in that moment? He looks for inspiration outside of his own free will. So therefore, uh, one important step in unlocking your free will and utilizing your free will appropriately is to take help. Phone a friend. 
That's why we have divine books. That's why we have divine teachers. That's why we have divinity within that we can connect with. So the strength of one's spirituality is dependent on their connection with uh, divine people, divine wisdom and divinity within, because that helps us to understand what to do when we don't know what to do. Because yes, we're limited and we have a limited perception. And so the real utilization of free will is also to tap in to a higher will that can guide you. I hope that helps. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I just had a question about, uh, I'm also from London, by the way, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> same to you, same to you. Um, the idea of karma and the lessons that we are to learn from it. I'm interested how the Gita touches on the idea of uh, human generation, like intergenerational human, you know, passing on the things. So, like you know, and things like that. not so much physically, but more energetically. So intergenerational trauma or things that, you know, seem to pass down through the kind of human lineage as opposed to potentially your own personal spiritual lineage, kind of how do they weave together? If that, does that make sense? So for example, if someone grows up in a family where they experience trauma like that, you mean- And the, potentially that family has experienced trauma in and the past, going back generations and- And so it's somewhat is, uh, they, they receive some of that themselves. Right but also the idea of them as an individual yeah, having their Yeah, how does that balance with their own free will and because it seems to be imposed upon them yeah. or, or impressed upon them. Sure. Excellent point, yeah. I mean, modern psychology says we are a combination of nature and nurture. So basically, there's certain uh, psychophysical impressions which we're born with and then according to our interactions and associations and experiences in this life, um, in our upbringing, that molds our personality further. Karma is an intricate law because the idea is that everything you're born with, whether it be intergenerational trauma, or whether it be a certain social situation, or whether it be the people that we're surrounded by, everything is actually tailor-made. It's a difficult one to digest. And if I'm honest with you, uh, it's still difficult for me, but it still makes sense to me. It makes sense in my head, but sometimes in the heart, it's a little difficult because people go through such difficult situations in life. People go through such trauma, such struggle. Sometimes it becomes very difficult to uh, like, like, <coughs> Why would anyone have to go through that? It's very difficult. But uh, the idea is that everything, not everything that happens is good, but something good can come from everything that happens. And so we would understand according to the philosophy of the Gita that any challenge that anyone encounters, whether and, and in whatever way, shape or form that may come, um, difficult as it is, and it's really not for us to then judge them and say, well, it's your karma, you, you know, that's not the purpose of karma. Karma is used for our own introspection, not to judge others. But we try to empower and uh, give people hope and say, karma is also a powerful law because it means you can change your life. Uh, Karma means where you are doesn't determine who you are. This is just one phase you're in at your, of your life at the moment and you can break out of that. But in essence to your question, yes, everything we can say is, is arranged, it's tailor-made. And even difficult situations, there's something that comes from it that helps us on our journey. Even though it can be often difficult to decipher what that is. 
I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, so I'm really interested in your, you know, sort of like five actor thought model of the world where you have identity, you have nature, karma, time, and God. Um, and what you say is that this is very explanatory for a lot of big existential phenomena and questions. So what I'm curious about is within, you know, your 20 years as a monk, what gives you such strong confidence in this model? That's an excellent question. Um, I often feel like I mentioned here that life is the best teacher. Sometimes people ask me, how did you learn what you learned? And I almost like feel as though I learned the theory in the books and I experienced the reality before my eyes. What fascinated me, you, you could see on my last slide, I, I put the kind of tagline, uh, wisdom that breathes. And what fascinated me about the ancient scriptures is that I found them to basically corroborate every experience that I went through in life. In other words, they began to uh, reveal to me um, the confusions that I was seeing before my eyes. And that gave me a lot of faith because it wasn't just a theory, it wasn't just a concept, it wasn't just something that sounded good that you had to have faith in, but it was something that I was seeing playing out before me. The second thing that gave me a lot of faith in these teachings is that when I lived by these teachings and I applied them in my life, then I saw the positive benefits, I saw the uh, empowering effect that they could have on me. Most importantly, more, most importantly, I saw the transformative effect it could have on me. For perhaps the hardest thing in this world is to change ourselves, to change our character, to change our approach to life. And when I started applying spiritual teachings, I saw an incredible transformation in myself I was like, wow, this is uh, amazing. And I think the third thing uh, which really gave me a lot of faith in this model uh, was experiences of divinity. Those are very, I think, very individual and very subjective and I won't go into like individual examples with you. I really felt as though the Bhagavad Gita was a book which was not teaching me to believe in God, but was empowering me with the tools, process, and practices to perceive the presence of God at every moment in my life. And therefore, I really felt um, a reciprocation with divinity. It was funny, when I came to the Hare Krishna movement, <laughs> and I, I was kind of like, you know, as you do, you like check out the people, like how they talk, how they walk, and, and these, these people, they would just say things like, Oh, Krishna, he's playing a trick on me. Or, Oh, Krishna, he's probably trying to teach me this lesson. Or, Oh, Krishna, like, it's funny how he arranged that. And this, for me, was mind-blowing. Because I had never thought of divinity as someone who would be so involved in my life. I was like, God is up there. Like, you just follow the rules, don't get on his case, he won't get on your case. Man. <laughs> you know, just like, keep it sweet, you know? And here were these people talking about divinity in such a personal way. And I was like, this is amazing. I want to experience that divinity. So I think this is a journey we all go on. I think this wisdom comes alive, therefore, when you reflect upon it according to your experience. I think it comes alive when you apply it to create your life going forward. And I think it comes alive when you use it to actually try to enter into a transcendent connection with the divine and then try to experience what may come of that.
And so when people were teaching me the Bhagavad Gita, they didn't teach it to me so much as a religion, but rather as a spiritual science. And what happens in the world today is we draw such an aggressive demarcation between science and spirituality that this is objective and this is in a different realm. Whereas in this spiritual path, I found somewhat of a synthesis between those two. So those are some words. I don't know how much time we have. I'm just uh, conscious because we are I'm sure you're all very respectful and some may want to go on to other things. I'm okay, but... Exactly. I think uh, we we'll respect everybody's time. If you have any question, you can uh, talk to uh, uh, Keshav Swami uh, personally. But uh, thanks a lot uh, for this lecture. I want to ask one last question since I have the ability to do so. Uh, uh, so these power, gossips, power corrupts. Uh, it's just acting my free will. Uh, so these concepts that you shared are definitely very profound if properly introspected on or reflected upon these concepts. Uh, they have the ability to shift the paradigm, I believe. But what's that one practical tip that you want everybody uh, to kind of implement it tomorrow, next 20 days, 30 days, that can help them free their free will? What's the little thing you know I can do after going home tomorrow morning for the next 30 day as a 30 day challenge? Like, how can I implement this? Um. Oh gosh, you ask me these questions, you know, it's difficult. It's, there's so many things that go through your mind, what could I ask you to do? Um, I would just say, okay, here I'll give you one practical thing which has helped me, and I don't think you should do it just for the next 30 days, you should do it for the rest of your life. Um, the first habit we learned as monks was to rise before the sun. We learned that the morning, sorry. <laughs> so you knew it was coming, what to do? <laughs> Telling students to rise before the sun. We learned that the morning hours are the golden hours. The sun is the source of all energy in the universe and when you rise with that sun, then you draw from that energy. We learned as monks that when you utilize the morning hours, you double your creativity, you triple your productivity, and you quadruple your energy. Like it really does something to you. And so what I often tell people to do is try to implement a routine in your life, a morning routine. If you can do an hour, it would be amazing. 20, 20, 20. I tell people 20 minutes, move. Get the blood circulation going, do some yoga whatever it may be. 20 minutes, learn. Read some wisdom, uh, open your mind, explore uh, what you don't know, you don't know, uh, and see what insights you could glean that could help your journey forward on that day. And 20 minutes, uh, reflect or meditate, turn the attention inwards, and, uh, and see if you can just be still. There's something in stillness which is beautiful and which uh, really helps us to build intention. And so, uh, 20, 20, 20, move. What was the second one? Learn. Learn. And, uh, and reflect or meditate. And I think if you do those, and if you can't do one hour, then, um, then do five, 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 and then do 10, 10, 10. So those are some thoughts. Can I just say something about, since I've got the mic, <laughs> and I have free will, and I have freed my free will to go in your company. I'll just do a little bit of self-promotion here. Uh, we just have a couple of books here, of course. Can you give me the other books also? Yeah. Let me start with these, because these are the, the foundational ones. These are some books. Yes, we're giving you more books. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, then please do grab a copy. Um, it's got all the 700 verses here. It brings this blueprint alive, and it's, uh, yeah, something um, 
it's a present which you can keep opening again and again. Um, and these are two more books. This is a vegetarian cookbook. We talked about sattva earlier today and how your diet has such an impact. And this is called The Science of Self-Realization. So it's like conversations with Bhaktivedanta Swami, like an accomplished Vedic scholar, um, and, and very amazing conversations. And then these are a couple of books I've written. Um, uh, this one's called Tattva. So I just, in this book, try to uh, share with people some of my reflections on life as I live and travel as a monk. I share with you something of my monastic journey. And I share with people uh, some of the main questions that I, I get asked in universities and corporate firms and the different forums in which we share knowledge. And maybe some of those uh, questions resonate with you. So um, that's one. And this book's called Gita 3. Sometimes the Bhagavad Gita can be philosophically quite heavy um, for many people. So what we try to do in this book is just break it down into like practical exercises and, and ways in which you can distill the essence and apply it in your life. So um, should you be uh, willing and interested and have space, then we have these books here and you can kind of just uh, give a donation and uh, take some away with you. And uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, thank you, Keshav Swami, uh, for the wonderful <laughs>